Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll do our best to condense this and get us back on uh, topic. We've heard a lot of really good presentations today, and, and a lot of the information that pertains to this has been already covered, so I think that makes my life very easy. Um, I have multiple disclosures, but none related to this. Um, you know, our present organ allocation system, as we've heard, is to get as many people to transplant as we can, i.e., transplant the sicker patients. Um, in reality, from the physician's point of view, our focus tends to be on how do we set these people up for success. So, you know, how do we get that organ to last as long as it possibly can? Are we putting it in the right patient? Are we using the right technologies to bridge these patients to transplant? And are we doing it at the right time? That's what most of these discussions have been built around. Internally, uh, we chose to look at our trends uh, as they evolved immediately before the new allocation system and into the new allocation system to try to figure out if we were doing the right things to set our patients up for success. Um, we noted a few things, and I'll cover just, just a few of them, but when we looked at our use of non-dischargeable mechanical assist devices, we saw a tremendous uptick in 2018 and 2019. I think there were a number of reasons for that. As we looked at what the new organ allocation system was going to be like, and as we looked at our patient populations, we realized that taking chances on LVAD patients with right hearts that didn't work was going to be problematic. We realized that we weren't really doing patients favors if we put a HeartMate 3 or, or a HVAD in and then discharge them on inotropes. Uh, we were sort of setting them up for a bad outcome. We looked at our uh, length of stay and our cost related to these patients. And as you see here, we saw about 119% increase in cost. And I think a lot of that was due to changing technologies and changing the way we approach these patients. Internally, that uh, did provoke a, a number of us to say, should we be doing something differently? You know, should we be looking at these patients a little differently than we have historically? It was pretty easy in the previous allocation system to say, you know, you get sick, you have a TAH, your right heart doesn't work, we'll get you a, a 1A exemption and get you transplanted. It doesn't exist in the current system. So we saw this presented earlier uh, regarding the early data from the national experience. We saw kind of a similar thing uh, prior to this change. Uh, less than 10% of our patients were uh, managed with uh, uh, non-dischargeable MCS. After the change, we saw that go up to over 50%. And costs have gone up exponentially, both inpatient costs, organ allocation, procurement costs. Um, it, just makes a big difference. So can we do something to contain some of this and how do we think about it? So when we look at the challenges of timing and, and getting the patients in at the right time, it really is more about um, what patients are we willing to take a chance with or set up for success with an LVAD versus set up for success with other technologies. So I think the easy ones are the ones that qualify for an LVAD. They're no-brainers. Um, we've talked about several of those. You have a 70-year-old with multiple comorbidities. Uh, you're probably not going to transplant those. You're going to put an LVAD in them, or you're going to treat them medically. But the reality is, what about the patients who are LVAD candidates on the surface, but they have a high likelihood of uh, failure? Uh, they're going to have uh, infection-related complications. They're not going to be able to take care of the device, and they're going to you know, go down the tubes. What about the patients with pulmonary dysfunction and RV failure requiring ECMO? We've all seen the slides, we've all seen the tables. ECMO patients don't do as well after transplant when you go straight from ECMO to transplant. It's the worst outcome with mechanical support going through transplant. So we're probably going down the wrong road if we're going straight from ECMO to transplant. Um, this is a seven-day window, at which point you have to re-qualify for that status one. It's not hard to re-qualify for it, but the clock is also ticking. Uh, there's worse survival. And then the timing of conversion to other therapies uh, is really within that five-day window. When you look at it, it's that five- to seven-day window when the wheels start falling off the bus. So you need the lungs to improve quickly. Can you convert to some sort of biventricular support? 
i.e. TAH, i.e. non-dischargeable VIVADs, but you have to make that decision as we heard with our last presentation very quickly. Um, survival going from ECMO to transplant is just not great. What about the borderline RV dysfunction with some end organ dysfunction? Um, there are limited options for these patients in today's era if they are not a transplant candidate. Um, it's going to be some form of destination therapy, plus minus inotropes and ways to support the RV. But it's not going to be a great rosy picture for that patient 10 years from now. If they're clearly a transplant patient, what we do want to avoid is that scenario of LVAD plus inotropes. Um, we should either look at non-dischargeable therapies if they're clearly a transplant candidate and transplant them, or if more appropriate, put a TAH in them and list them as a status two when the time comes around. If they're a future transplant candidate, uh, as a lot of our patients are, and they have behavioral or correctable issues that uh, the team feels is going to get them to transplant, then by all means correct those issues. Don't try to shoehorn them into a transplant. Consider TAH, resolve the issues, and then list them as a status two. Oftentimes these patients come in in shock, they're critically ill, they're very sick, their creatinine's up, and their liver functions are rising. Um, studies have shown that bilirubins greater than three are problematic, bilirubins that are rising are problematic, so step back, think about it before you jump in the, uh, the quick decision of putting an organ in those patients. Uh, you probably want to correct that hepatic dysfunction or give it a good shot before you go there. I think the elephant in the room in discussion with our patients, and we haven't really touched on it today, is, is what do you do with the post-implant oliguric renal failure? Um, how do we handle that? I think that is a, uh, a discussion that many of the thought leaders in this room can have with one another, what our institutions are doing to avoid it, to manage it, to deal with it, because getting these patients dialyzed as an outpatient can be problematic. So I think we need a robust strategy for that, and that will actually, I think, help us um, with a lot of the naysayers for total artificial heart support. The other issues we've touched upon, uh, DT's a problem. Uh, we change patients to bridge to decision, probable transplant. Uh, internally, we don't do that a lot, but I think as a community, that happens a lot. Um, there is a potential for device failure. I think it's infrequent. I think it's a low probability, but continued work by the company and industry, I think, is going to help us with that. It's not totally implantable. Driveline infections still remain a problem. It's noisy. You have to factor that in when you think about a patient's psyche. We've heard those things are going away, but we're probably a year away from that. Uh, chronic anemia is a problem, and thus the end-stage renal population is a population that I, we would certainly stay away from, and it sounds like a lot of people in the room would probably stay away from that unless forced to uh, jump in. Uh, it's very difficult in today's organ allocation world to get combo heart kidneys. Um, it's doable, but it's not highly probable. So I think you have to deal with those patients. So all in all, I think, as we heard from our UNOS colleague, uh, it is worrisome if practice patterns are changing. I think what we need is an analysis of why those patterns are changing. And I think we need to think very carefully on the front end about the technologies we apply and when. If we're if we have the ability to move toward appropriate ventricular support, either univentricular or biventricular, before these patients come in in cardiogenic shock, then we should do that. If we have the ability to tune them up, as Dr. Morales has uh, reminded us a few times, um, we need to tune them up, because otherwise we're going to have bad outcomes. And we're not going to be good stewards of the organs we're transplanting because those organs aren't going to last as long. We all love the 20, 30 year patient survivals after transplant, but if we're really putting these organs in people who are critically ill coming off VA ACMO, we're not gonna see that. We're gonna see 80% one year survival numbers and we're all gonna be kicking ourselves as we look at our data. So what have we learned? Well, internally, and I think we're all seeing the same thing, uh, mostly status one and two patients are getting transplanted. 
a biventricular failure is a problem. We really need to consider TAH, work as a community to make sure everybody is using appropriate uh, implant strategies and setting patients up for success when these devices come out for transplant. Some status threes and fours are getting transplanted in our institution. They're largely non-blood group O patients, and they're largely very small stature patients. I think I heard somebody mention five, six or less. Uh, in reality, that's exactly what we're seeing. We're not transplanting a lot of status fours. Um, we're having a lot of difficulty in even transplanting some status threes that have significant pump-related issues. Um, management of RV failure is a problem, and you want to do it on the front end. You don't want the worst thing we can do as a as a group of people is implant a lot of univentricular devices, struggle with RV function, then take out that device and put a TAH in. That's not going to make the economics for our hospital systems uh, look very positive. So doing the right implant at the right time is very important. Um, most people who meet status one criteria are really sort of too sick for anything. I mean, they're, they're pretty sick. And in my opinion, they need an aggressive tune-up. And I think many of the panelists that have discussed earlier today feel the same way. Um, Dr. Arabia, wherever he's hiding, uh, gave us a really nice uh, five or six item uh, list of the things that you want to avoid, and I'm not going to repeat those. So I think everybody got that message. And we have to remember the first thing we want to do is do no harm. We want to do the right thing for our patients. And we also want to be good stewards of the organs we're implanting. If we're, if we're not implanting them in the right people, that too is going to come and bite us down the road from UNOS. Uh, so with that, I will be quiet and let us get back on topic. Questions? I promise you. You know, you have to think about uh, outcomes. You know, and, and that's a two-way street. The outcomes in Toronto are about 82% one-year survival. In Germany, they're about the same. I was talking to Schmitto the other day. And maybe, it may be that if you have a 90% one-year survival, you're transplanting patients that aren't sick enough to be transplanted. And I think that's the other aspect of it, and particularly with 147 centers approved to do tra transplants in America, if you're, if you're doing five or six a year, you're going to do patients that aren't very sick, because you have to to keep your program going. And all that, of course, is because, uh, you know, when Phil Hoyer and I were working on this in the 80s, we thought, you know, people aren't going to want to fool with these transplants. In 10 years, there won't be 20 centers in all of America doing transplants. And I can't figure it out except uh, I was talking to him like 10 years after that, and we've, the, the heart failure cardiologists don't want to send their patients somewhere else. And uh, that, anyway, that was our conclusion. I don't know what it is, but, but I think you've got to be suspect of centers that have zero, and I think uh, outcomes uh, or deaths. And I think, uh, you know, we, sh we should look at five and 10 year survival too, because that particularly if you're, uh, you know, if you're transplanting patients in their 30s and 40s, uh, that prematurely, uh, it's a it's a real question. Well, I think I think good points, especially with the new allocation changes. Five and ten year data are going to be very important. Um, I, I think right now the bar is set very high. If you're a transplant program, and your one year survival is not ninety plus percent, you're probably going to be subject to review and uh, answering a lot of questions. Uh, maybe the bar is too high. But right now, that's the bar. So, you know, our colleagues at UNOS continuing to look at things, continuing to see where should that bar be? Are we being realistic or unrealistic? Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, we've transplanted patients coming off TAH, coming off MCS, both long term and short term, uh, since uh, starting before the out, just before the allocation changes, and uh, we've tracked it very closely because. 
we're probably the only institution of our size in the country that had a wholesale change of our anesthesiologist between June 30th and July 1st, which made for a really nice, you get to date a lot of new people and figure out relationships. But the reality is we've tracked it very carefully. And in that time period, um, you know, we have found that with certain changes to the way we do business, with setting the team up to look more like the Golden State Warriors than the Charlotte Hornets, being from Charlotte, I can say that. So, um, you know, there's a big difference between those teams. And so our team in the OR looks vastly different than it did before that. And uh, we're up at, uh, I think, 33 organ implants uh, with uh, no OR-related uh, mortalities. And uh, I think we've had one mortality that was several months after the fact that was more related to patient protoplasm than anything that happened surgically. So I think with the right team mates and the right structure, we may be able to make that 80% look more like 90%, but it's gonna require investment, it's gonna re uh, require collaboration and understanding from our administrative colleagues. So, thank you.